So thanks for the introduction and thanks for the invitation. It's really a pleasure of being here. And what I want to do uh, is to give you uh, a brief overview of uh, where high-performance computing is going, at least in the U.S., uh, and uh, what trends uh, you should expect to see coming uh, uh, in the next few years. <coughs> So let's start with uh, where we are now, or where we shall be in a few uh, uh, years. As you know, probably have heard it by now, uh, we in the United States have a strategic computing initiative that was uh, decreed by, by the current president and hopefully will not disappear when the new president comes uh, into place. Uh, and the goals of this initiative succinctly uh, uh, listed are to uh, uh, develop an exaflop computing system uh, uh, and 10 to the 18 operation per second, uh, converge large-scale simulation and large-scale analytics, and continue the path of extreme computing beyond exascale and beyond Moore's law, uh, when uh, CMOS is expected to slow down. So these are goals which are explicitly listed. Various agencies in the US uh, have different roles, in particular the Department of Energy, uh, to whom uh, Argo National Lab belongs, uh, is responsible for setting up an exaflop system uh, by 2023. Is it strange or is it uh, uh, a stretch? If you assume that life continues uh, and uh, previous trends are predictable, previous trends are predictable uh, of future trends, the next flop in 2023 is not really surprising. In fact, we should have been, at, or we should reach exaflow before that if you just extrapolate from previous trends. But clearly, trends don't always, past is not always predictable of the future, as I always get warned from my investment, on my investments. Uh, trends may not continue. So, where are we today? These are the systems that are now leading in this uh, much reviled uh, top 500 LIMPAC uh, uh, way of measuring performance. The fastest system uh, is in China, the Tianhe 2, uh, followed by the Titan system uh, in, uh, uh, at Oak Ridge, followed by the Sequoia system at Lawrence Livermore in the US the K system in Japan, and the Mira at my lab at Argon. Uh, these are the top systems in the uh, top 500 list. The thing that I would like to emphasize, these are not only top 500 uh, systems. They are used to do real research. Uh, the most performing application on Sequoia has been the Hack. Uh, which is uh, the hack simulation code, which is a simulation of the evolution of the universe. I don't remember a few hundred, uh, hundred thousand years after Big Bang to understand how galaxies are forming. It has achieved a, peak, a performance and a sustained performance of 14.5 petaflop on Sequoia. And the uh, system that has achieved the uh, or the application that has achieved the highest performance on Titan is uh, the bonsai code, which is also a cosmological simulation code. And if you look at the numbers on this table, it looks strange because it achieves more than the peak performance. And the reason is that it's running on single precision and therefore can achieve twice as much performance than the nominal performance at double precision. And I shall come back, shall come back to this theme uh, later in my talk. So we do science at Petaflop. It's not only machines for uh, uh, national prestige. Where are we going from there? We expect in uh, two, three years to have several machines that are running at 100, 200 Petaflop uh, in the US. 
uh, orders have already been put for at least uh, uh, three systems, uh, uh, a system using uh, IBM CPUs and NVIDIA GPUs and Mellanox switch, uh, which will be installed at uh, Oak Ridge and a similar system will be installed at Lawrence Livermore and uh, a system that uses uh, uh, the KNH generation of the Intel Phi, uh, Intel Phi systems that will be installed at our lab. Uh, both will uh, have performance uh, way above 100 petaflop. Uh, and if you look at the evolution from current system to, to this future generation, I don't know if you can read that, uh, but basically, I know I cannot read it, but uh, basically uh, these are systems that will be in the range of uh, 100, 200 petaflop. Uh, we'll have, in the case of uh, Summit, order of 16,000 nodes, so uh, uh, a small number of very powerful nodes, uh, and you see the other arguments. Uh, the thing that is interesting here, uh, memory is, increases, is increasing much less than the compute power. The compute power increases by a factor of 18, I believe. Memory increases by a factor of 2.5. And I.O. is basically not changing at all. Uh, it stays at around one terabyte second. So you'll have a machine that is uh, 20 times more powerful but this I.O. is not improving. And that's fundamentally a constraint of the technology. Uh, disks uh, are not becoming any faster, or not becoming significantly faster these days. Uh, if we look at our machine, uh, the results are somewhat similar. Uh, in our case, uh, uh, memory is increasing by a factor of 10, which is still less than the increase in compute power. And I.O. is increasing by a factor of three, I believe, which is significantly less than the increase in, uh, in uh, compute power. So you will have machines which have more and more compute power, relatively less memory, relatively uh, or significantly less I.O. relatively to their compute power. Uh, key features of these machines, uh, you have coherent shared memory. So if you have used GPUs in the past, you had to deal with GPUs that were in an I.O. bus and you had to work in detail on the transfer of data between GPU and CPUs. Future machines, the GPU and the CPU can both access uh, the same memory in a cache coherent manner. So the work of uh, uh, moving tasks from CPU to GPU is still something you need to do for performance, but you don't need to worry about it from correctness. So uh, uh, you, you can be f uh, less accurate in what you move from CPU to GPU. Uh, all components are tightly coupled. In our case, for example, uh, we have, uh, uh, for the Intel Phi, we shall have uh, memory which is in the same package as the CPU. We shall have the network interface in the same chip as the CPU. So everything becomes much more tightly coupled than in current systems. Uh, memory is heterogeneous. Uh, you were accustomed always of having caches and many levels of caches which have different behavior. Now you have different levels of memory which have different behavior. So in the case of the IBM NVIDIA system, which has CPUs and GPUs, there is still a system memory for the GPU and the system memory or uh, uh, and the memory for the CPUs. They are distinct, they are coherent, but depending on where you put your data in one memory or the other, you will get better performance from GPU or CPU. In our case, we shall have uh, a relatively small amount in terms of, you know, relatively small uh, gigabytes of memory, which is very fast, significantly faster than current uh, uh, memory, but, and it's tightly packaged on the same package as the CPUs, and we shall have a uh, fast, uh, larger memory that is slower, that is uh, outside the, the tight package of the CPU. 
Uh, one big change uh, is the use of NVRAM, non-volatile random access memory. Uh, the uh, non-volatile memory is slower than, radical mem than regular memory, significantly slower, but on the other hand, is non-volatile, so if you lose power, it's still around, and it consumes essentially nothing if you don't, when you don't access it. So it's much lower uh, energy than regular DRAM memory that needs to be refreshed all the time. So NVRAM is looking very interesting. The first use of NVRAM is likely to be as a cache to the disk. Disks are, are slow, they don't increase in bandwidth, but typically I.O. done for, uh, uh, for checkpoint restart or I.O. done for keeping uh, uh, information at each stage of your computation, at each iteration. This I.O. is bursty. If you can uh, use your NVRAM as a cache to, to, to accommodate this burst, you can get then more steady state I.O. to the disk, improving uh, I.O. performance uh, significantly. NVRAM is likely to be used for checkpoint restart, again faster than going to the disk, and eventually NVRAM is likely to use a lot for buffering data in between one uh, stage of a computation to another, in between simulation and analysis, and uh, uh, heavily used for this vision of combining in one platform uh, data analysis and simulation. So if people are old enough to remember something called out-of-core algorithms, time to refresh your memory and think again of how you are moving data uh, between f big, slow memory and fast, uh, uh, small memory uh, to get the advantage of both. Uh, total memory scale less than performance. Uh, <laughs> there are basically two reasons. Memory is expensive and I'm going to discuss that again later in my talk, and memory consumes power quite a lot, so uh, you end up uh, with less memory, with a different balance, and this I.O., as I said, is not uh, scaling almost at all. So these are architectural trends. More generally, uh, the main thing you have to think about when you think of the next generation what constrains us increasingly is power, energy consumption. We could certainly put much more powerful systems if we were willing to go beyond uh, the current uh, energy limits, energy consumption limit of our current systems. The kind of target for exascale is a range of 20, 30 uh, megawatt per system. And it's hard to stay with this, in this envelope. Not staying with this in the envelope totally changes the way you think of a machine room or a big supercomputer. So how to get there, how to uh, uh, stay with this, uh, this envelope is a key problem of future supercomputing. One thing that has happened already for years now the power of individual cores, of individual hardware thread, has not increased, probably has not increased for more than 10 years this day. Has not increased because we don't know uh, how to increase clock uh, speed without over-consuming uh, uh, energy, without overheating our, our uh, chips, and because uh, uh, the benefit of more complex architecture is not in proportion to the increase in power consumption of a more complex architecture. So in fact, we have gone the reverse way. We have gone to CPUs which are simpler and less powerful than those that we were using 10 years ago because they get a better performance energy ratio than more complex architectures which means that for years now, any increase in performance requires a, a proportional increase in the number of cores, in the number of hardware threads that we're having. So when we discuss exascale, we discuss systems that will have hundreds of millions of concurrent hardware threads. 
We cannot run all components of a chip at maximum speed, and I'm going to show you some slides. Even today, uh, if you run every core, every CPU, every floating point unit at maximum speed, you are going to fry the chip. So all processors that are coming out these days have power management, have power control. They try to raise up the power consumption, speed up the clock, increase the frequency, uh, increase voltage. Uh, when there is spare power, reduce frequency, reduce voltage. When the chip is running uh, 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 hotter, too hot. Many supercomputing systems have the capability of uh, power management in the chips they are using. All modern uh, Intel CPUs, for example, have power management. Many supercomputing systems are just turning off this option because people don't know how to manage with CPUs that are running faster and slower according to whatever is the temperature on each chip. Uh, but we will not be able to afford this luxury in the future. We are leaving too much performance on the table if we are running all the time, all the chips, at the lowest speed, lowermost speed, that any of these chips can run, or you know, running all the cores at the lowermost chip, uh, lowermost speed. So we will need to accommodate chips that are uh, fluctuating up and down in their power cores that are fluctuating up and down in their power. Basically, in the future, equal work does not mean anymore equal compute time which is a fundamental assumption in basically any parallel code that I am aware of. How you deal without this assumption, I think, is a fundamental change that one needs to think about it. And again, no surprises here, most energy is not spent on, on uh, computation, it's spent on communication. Uh, if you look at a modern chip, I think the floating point units consume one or two percent of the total energy of the chip. Everything else goes in caches, in buses, in what I call communication over time, which is memory and caches and communication over space, which are buses and, uh, and channels. So what we need to think when we think about the future is how we handle uh, these uh, effects. Just to give you some evidence of what I just said, uh, here is an experiment done by people in my, uh, in my lab, in my division, uh, showing performance uh, of the same code with different assumption, uh, with turbo, turbo mode uh, on. Uh, if you are running only one uh, core and everything else is quiescent, you can achieve 23 gigaflop on this core. If you are running only one core, but the other cores are not quiescent, you achieve only 13 or 14 gigaflop. And uh, if you are running all the cores uh, together, you achieve 285 gigaflop. I think that's a 16 core system, if I remember correctly. So you see that all the cores together are not running 16 times faster than one core. And if you run one core in isolation, uh, it's significantly more than one sixteen of the 16 core running together. That's a DGEM uh, example. So if you can turn off cores that you don't use, you get significantly higher performance on the cores that you actually need. Uh, and uh, uh, you know, even cores which are idle but have not been turned off are still lowering down the performance of the cores that is doing the computation quite significantly. Here is another example which is quite interesting. These are measurements, I think, of the same DGM. I don't remember, maybe something else, uh, of two uh, chips which are doing exactly the same, running exactly the same workload. The two chips are supposed to be identical, uh, but you see very different temperature when they're running the same workload. So another thing to keep in mind, uh, today when you buy two samples of exactly the same chip, you are not buying the same thing because there are huge variations in manufacturing. And depending on where your chip was on the wafer, you may get different behavior 
of uh, how fast it can run, how quickly it, uh, it uh, heat up uh, when it runs uh, a particular workload. So if I wanted to take the best of a system that has these two chips, I will want to run them at different uh, uh, speeds, at different voltage, to get the best combination of power of uh, energy to performance. Uh, the fact that different cores will run at different speed means that we will need to avoid synchronization. Synchronization always means waiting, or a barrier means to wait for the last one to reach some barrier. The more asynchronous, the most different are the cores in the compute speed, uh, the more uh, likely it is that you are waiting to one that's particularly slow. In the past, we were worried about uh, system noise, jitter, Torsten has done very nice work on that. In the future, the main problem is, uh, is power management that is changing the speed of chips. Uh, so in a sense, you have to assume that the time it takes to do a particular computation is stochastic. Uh, you have some bounds, you, have, you know the distribution, but you cannot assume it's deterministic in any way, and you need to use dynamic scheduling to schedule resources efficiently. But remember, today when you think of dynamic scheduling, you think which is going to be the cause that's going to execute a particular thread. And uh, using dynamic scheduling entails the cost of moving threads around, moving data around when you move the threads. In the future, you have two games you can play. You can decide which core is going to execute which thread and you can decide which core is getting more power, which core is getting less power. If one core is overloaded as compared to another core on your system, you have two choices. You can move some of the computation from the overloaded code uh, core to the cores which are less loaded, but you can also give more power to the overloaded core and less power to those that have a lighter load. So how you use these two, uh, uh, these two uh, possibilities uh, when to use one, when to use the other, to use one for short-term vari variations, the other for longer-term variation, is going to be an interesting uh, issue to think through. Uh, one thing that I want to emphasize, uh, uh, there is one bottleneck that today's all calls basically have, and that's a bottleneck of uh, communicating outside the chip. Typically, codes in the OE these days are using uh, OpenMP for using multi-threading inside the chip, are using uh, MPI for communicating outside the chip, and typically MPI is used in sequential parts uh, of the code. And, and the reason is that when you try to use MPI concurrently from different parts of your parallel code on chip, uh, performance is quite lousy. And here is some measurement done by one of my students. Uh, what you have here is a simple ping pong test where uh, one thread is sending uh, messages to a thread in another uh, node. And uh, the top line, the red line, is 16 threads on one node six sending uh, MPI messages to 16 threads on another node, the pure ping pong. And uh, when 16 threads try to communicate simultaneously, uh, it takes more than 100 microseconds per message. Whereas only one thread communicate, you typically have one, two microseconds per message. And the reason is that they are, rather than doing useful work, they are just uh, uh, thrashing, trying to get access to the MPI library and to the communication hardware. So uh, getting communication to be uh, parallel is a problem for computer science. It's doable. In fact, that's what's the point of this graph, that once we did the right thing for message passing, we could totally avoid this thrashing behavior and have 16 threads ping pong simultaneously with the same performance as one thread uh, ping-ponging simultaneously. But once you get to chips like the Intel Phi, which have hundreds of simultaneously uh, executing threads, it will not be feasible, I believe, 
uh, to uh, have all communication being serialized, and that require changes in the runtime, in the MPI libraries, and in the runtime that supports OpenMP and MPI, and it will require algorithms that really take advantage of simultaneous communication from many threads on one node to many threads on another node. Doable, but require work. Uh, the other point that I made is that communication is energy, energy is communication. I gave you some numbers, you can find many numbers in the literature. Uh, that's a very famous, or oh, many times reproduced slide of Bill Daly that shows <coughs> uh, how many uh, joules, picojoules, nanojoules, you consume to move data and inside the chip, uh, basically, uh, as you see, doing uh, a floating point multiplication is 20 picojoule. Moving a bit out of the uh, to DRAM is already 16 nanojoule, 1,000 times uh, larger, so almost 1,000 times larger. So most of the energy is really moving data in and out of chip, and secondarily, moving it inside the chip for longer distances and storing it in caches. Here is only the dynamic energy of moving data. The static energy of caches and memory is also very significant. So you want to reduce uh, energy consumption. You have to reduce communication. Uh, there are several uh, lines of work in this direction. Uh, recently, there has been a renewed interest in communication optimal algorithms. Uh, we knew in the past how to do FFT, so how to do matrix multiplication uh, with minimal number of communications. Recently, Demel and his team and other partners have done a lot on a variety of linear algebra algorithms showing how to do them in a communication optimal manner. Uh, but there are a lot of areas where we really don't know how much communication is really needed if you look at PDE solvers in any shape or form, uh, we have no knowledge of how fast can we push down communication for these kind of algorithms. The other point which is much simpler, and again, there has been work by Dongara and by many others, uh, you really don't need to use 64 bits. Uh, if you use 32 bits rather than 64 bits, uh, you have the amount of communication you have to memory, you have the amount of storage you need in your, in your memory, and you get a better uh, cache heat ratio because now you can store more words in your cache. Furthermore, you get on current architectures twice as much the, the flop rate because typically you can do two fixed point, two 32 bit flop, at the same time you do one 64 bit flop if you are using vector operation. Uh, Dongar, as I said, have done, uh, looked at hybrid algorithm for linear algebra. Uh, in our lab, that's work of uh, Wild, I should have put his name, and uh, St uh, Stefan Wild and Sven Leifer. Uh, we have been looking at uh, optimization algorithms, iterative optimization using uh, uh, indirect uh, Newton or Laplace Newton uh, for some problems. And uh, what you are seeing here is the time it takes to get some level of convergence uh, using 32-bit uh, floating point arithmetic and using 64-bit floating point arithmetic. And in a color that should have been red, but is not red, uh, you see the ratio between the two, which is 1.5 to, uh, to 2. Let me see if the next one is any easier to read. No. Uh, so the, almost the straight line is the ratio between the power measured for a 64-bit algorithm and the power measured, the power consumed by a 32-bit algorithm. And quite systematically, we use twice as much power with 64-bit for converging to the same uh, error as we use for 32-bit. So thinking again about what the precision you need. In fact, we're in the midst of running experiments with 16 bits, and it seems that we can get even better power convergence ratio 
uh, with 16 bit rather than 32 bit. The problem is that 16 bit, not all architecture or few architectures support currently. But uh, I think in the future, you will see increasing uh, availability and use of lower precision because that's a simple way of reducing power consumption and uh, a flourishing of or a renewed interest in, uh, in uh, numerical analysis to really understand what, what, uh, uh, how many digits of precision you need to get any result. I should mention that uh, at Oxford, I believe, there is very interesting work being done on using an exact uh, floating point for climate code and they have shown, again, very interesting results using algorithms that are precise only in 8 or 16 bits. Another thing that we hear a lot about is errors. Should uh, computers or should applications uh, cope with errors? And in particular, should applications cope with silent errors? Uh, I'm not sure. I think that won't be a problem. Uh, and, you know, uh, I don't say that with pleasure because I've done myself quite a lot of work on fault tolerance. Uh, but uh, it's, it's clear that uh, as you uh, decrease the size of your circuits, you get more frequent errors. It's also clear that it's not too hard to detect errors in hardware. It may be expensive to correct them, but it's not hard to detect them in hardware. So my assumption, the other point also that uh, it's important uh, to remember, and again, uh, uh, I have a student that is working on this, uh, errors, uh, if they are not detected in how, uh, immediately by the hardware, usually are causing uh, a crash, a failure, quite rapidly in your code. It's very rare, even if you have silent errors, that the silent error will propagate through your computation without causing, uh, you know, without being easily detectable because it totally uh, gave you results that are out of whack, or, convert, uh, uh, or uh, to the, in the reverse, many errors are totally hidden once you are using iterative algorithms because the iterations are hiding the error. You just converge a little bit more slowly. And we have many evidence to that extent that seems to indicate that uh, detection should not be something to be too worried about it. Either hardware will do it or software will do it without too much pain. Correction may take time. So again, it will be one more of the reasons that you cannot assume that all cores are running at the same speed because cores may be busy correcting errors that happen uh, during their computation. So that's as much as I want to say about the current generation. Uh, I want to discuss, how long do I still have? 10 minutes. So I want to spend 10 minutes discussing what will happen beyond 200 petaflop, one exaflop, beyond the next two generations of computers. So, you know, as you by now have heard many times, the reason uh, computers have uh, increased in performance exponentially is this so-called Moore's law, which has uh, uh, brought to us uh, decreasing feature sizes, therefore more transistors per chip on a quite regular basis, therefore more performance per chip on a quite regular basis, uh, a law which is less a law of nature that really a law of how the industry has been working for many decades. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, people have assumed Moore's law to continue for a while. Uh, a less famous law is Stein's law. If something cannot go forever, it will stop. So uh, clearly Moore's law cannot go forever. Eventually we have less than an atom per, per, uh, uh, per transistor. Uh, so the question is not uh, if Moore's law will stop, but when it will stop. And uh, there are clear signs that it has already slowed down quite significantly. So let me go a little bit through this. So first uh, point that is important. 
Moore's law has never been about getting faster chips. Moore's law, Moore's law has been always about getting uh, same performance at a lower cost. And the reason uh, vendors have gone to higher and higher levels of integration is because that allows them to get the same performance at lower cost. The optimal density uh, in terms of cost performance has always shifted toward denser and denser chips. Uh, and this can stop fundamentally for two reasons. It can stop because we don't know anymore how to increase the density of our chips. Uh, clearly, uh, when we go to uh, transistors that have only a few thousands or a few hundreds of atoms, they don't behave anymore uh, the same way. You get quantum effects, and we don't know exactly how to do that. But more importantly, Moore's law can stop just because it's becoming too expensive. It's certainly imaginable, and I think it's actually happening now, that we could, in principle, continue to increase the chip densities, but it's not worthwhile, and therefore the commodity technologies are not doing it because it doesn't pay. In which case, high-performance computing has an interesting dilemma. We could continue to push performance, but we then don't benefit from commodity technologies that gave us the uh, ch cheap computing. And whether we are willing to pay significantly more in order to continue to get more performance is an interesting issue that I think our community will have to face in less than 10 years. So let's look at some, uh, you know, let me go back and explain some of what I said. Uh, what has been behind Moore law for many uh, decades has been what's called Dinar scaling. Uh, Dinar scaling meant, uh, and that was uh, the law, if you wish, when I started doing VLSI <coughs> decades ago, you uh, decrease the feature of your transistor by a factor of lambda. It immediately means that you increase the number of transistors on the chip by a factor of lambda square without increasing the size of your chip. But it also turns out that you could increase the, uh, the speed of your clock by a factor of lambda or one over lambda, and uh, you would not change the power consumption of the chip. So that was, you know, the, the nice period. Just geometric shrinking would improve performance and without improving uh, um, the, without improving power consumption. In fact, uh, the uh, industry moved on a slightly different curve. They increased power consumption per chip because they increased the clock faster than these uh, uh, rules uh, should lead you to do. Uh, these denar scalings, what's called in this uh, uh, graph uh, geometric scale, oh, I apologize. Uh, what's called in this graph uh, geometrical scaling, this essentially stopped around 2004. And since that, uh, the industry has been in what it has called equivalent scaling, where you get the same ad uh, advance in performance, not purely through shrinking your devices, but through uh, what could call a series of uh, uh, one-of-a-kind tricks. Uh, changing materials, changing the geometry of the gates, changing uh, uh, the type of gates you are using, each time introducing a new refinement in the way you are designing transistors. And uh, when you do that, it becomes more and more expensive to design your chips, not only because you have to design smaller uh, features, but because you have to use more materials, you have to do, you have to design more complex circuits, and so on and so forth. So the slope has decreased already, uh, and you know people that are drawing more slow uh, on a, on the line are somewhat deceiving. Uh, we are already seeing a slowdown from new technology every two years to new technology every three years, and it probably continues to decrease. And uh, fundamentally, there are three obstacles that are causing more and more problems. Uh, one is that manufacturing costs keep going up. If you're using more material, it's harder to, to, to put different materials on the same chip. Uh, if you are using 
this kind of strange uh, 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 transistors, thin fat transistors, which are vertical rather than horizontal. It's harder to manufacture them. So a lot of reasons that manufacturing has become more complex, yields are going down, technology becoming harder to continue to push. Second reason is uh, that uh, decreasing feature size doesn't give you uh, the same uh, advantage in the density that you got before. Two reasons, you still have to have uh, some components which are large. What I've shown here is the number of, uh, of metal layers which are used to move current around. And the point is, uh, yes, we have smaller metal, we have finer features, but we still need also gross uh, metal layers to, to bring the power into the chip. So you still have layers which are using thick wires rather than fine wires. And the other point is if you are designing smaller uh, circuits and you have a larger variance, so you actually need uh, design rules which leave more distance between uh, different wires or different components, so you don't get an increase in density. Uh, which is, you know, the square of the decrease in, uh, in feature size. And the third point is uh, the technology, the lithography itself. Uh, industry had expected to move uh, to uh, extreme ultraviolet for manufacturing devices. Uh, remember, uh, you are now, we are now in technologies that are using devices which are 14, 16 nanometer feature size. We are using uh, uh, lasers with a wavelength of 192 nanometer, something that I regret not studying optics so that I don't, could understand how you can etch features that are smaller than your wavelengths. But basically what it means is that you are doing more and more passes over the same uh, uh, layer in order to get uh, the features uh, that you need. And that's becoming more and more expensive. I think now we are at 28 passes to get the features. Uh, so industry wanted to go to, to uh, ultraviolet, but we don't know how to generate enough power uh, in the ultraviolet spectrum, so industry has had to delay again and again uh, the shift to lower wavelengths. In fact, there is one company that could produce this technology in Holland. There has been a lot of injection of money into this company, and it still has not produced uh, you know, uh, the lithography equipment that's needed. Uh, there is a lot of debate whether uh, we already are seeing a regime where going down in uh, uh, feature size continues to improve cost performance. Uh, this is, you can see different views in the literature. Uh, that's a negative view, uh, an expert that claims that essentially beyond 28 nanometer we have not succeeded in improving cost performance, that any technology that has been introduced beyond 28 nanometer, 20 nanometer, 16, 14 nanometer, and soon 10 nanometer, is actually less cost performing uh, than 28 nanometer. And uh, Intel claims uh, that it continues to improve performance. Uh, bad tongs claims that it continues to improve cost performance because it was very bad at 28 nanometer. Uh, so how to know? But it seems that more and more uh, of the silicon foundries uh, seem to indicate that while they think they can go to a smaller feature size in the current environment, they don't think they can do it uh, in a cost-effective manner. And uh, uh, there are other symptoms, uh, you know, uh, new products are coming more slowly. For me, the main system, the main symptom is you have fewer and fewer vendors. Uh, one main problem for silicon manufacturing is that the investments you need into a new, uh, uh, into a new uh, plant are huge, measured in many billions of dollars. So obviously what you want is to have larger and larger 
production lines and uh, uh, the way to do larger and larger production lines is to consolidate and we have had over the years fewer and fewer uh, manufacturers of uh, silicon, of advanced silicon at 20 nanometer we have been left with only five manufacturers, only one of them based in Europe at 14 nanometer we probably will have only four and you know much below four three we cannot go so it, I would expect just looking at this graph, then the introduction of new technology will slow down. Same thing for DRAM. Uh, we essentially have three manufacturers of the most advanced DRAM. So no more, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> the number will not slow down, will not decrease. And in fact, progress in DRAM has slowed down significantly since uh, this consolidation happened. Finally, uh, more and more vendors are looking at how to make money not by doing faster uh, devices, but going uh, in what's called other than more, or going in many directions. The market is not driven necessarily by the need by faster compute devices. It's driven by mobile, low energy, a lot of different usages which don't necessarily give us the technology we want for high-performance computing. So where do we go from here? Uh, I wish I knew. Uh, but basically, there are two directions. You keep hearing about new devices replacing silicon, uh, nanotubes, uh, uh, a variety of uh, uh, different devices, uh, and uh, single atom transistors pick your own idea. Uh, and you hear, of course, of uh, new ways of using silicon, uh, specialized architecture, reconfigurable devices, uh, a lot of work on neurosynaptic, work on approximate computing, and so on and so forth, which are more and more exotic ways of using current silicon technology. And my point is, uh, you know, my point is that uh, maybe there is a technology that is going to come and replace silicon, but clearly working on stretch technologies is a must because there is no technology today for compute devices that promise uh, a better uh, cost uh, or a best uh, energy time ratio than silicon, the only set of technologies that seem to promise better uh, time compute or energy time uh, product than silicon are the uh, quantum uh, transistor based on the quantum tunneling effect, Josephson junctions and similar, uh, but that means moving to cryogenic uh, computing, to, to helium cooling, that's certainly not commodity technology anytime soon. So we shall be stuck at least for a decade, I think, on how we leverage silicon better than we've done today, uh, looking through uh, uh, a variety of ways of uh, uh, using specialized accelerators. And there are a lot of interesting works. There is, at least in my mind, a factor or an order of magnitude of better cost performance or, co or performance energy, really, that we could achieve by using uh, silicon in a better way. A specialized microprocessor, uh, accelerators of any kind and hue, uh, dark silicons, effects that you will have on one chip, uh, many accelerators that you will not use simultaneously, uh, using architectures that are push simplification well beyond what we have now. Uh, and the final point that I wish I had more time discussing that mobile technology not only gives us low power technology, which is important for HPC, but also gives us new ways of combining hardware design and software design in, uh, in, one, uh, in one activity, coordinated activity. And uh, therefore, I think it will be not only necessary, but also use easier to design specialized uh, uh, accelerators for, uh, uh, for high-performance computing. Anyhow, 
uh, let me end here. So, uh, the point that I wanted to make is that uh, just betting on silicon or uh, in integrated circuit technology uh, it doesn't seem to be feasible in the future. Even so, in principle, we have a long way to go before we uh, get to the physical limits of computing. Uh, so we will need to be smarter and smarter on how we design algorithms and how we use computers in the future. And, but we also have to think of, uh, you know, what's the envelope that are willing to accept uh, for those of you that are involved in the ITER effort of uh, uh, confined fusion, uh, I think the bill has been less, more than, do I have the right numbers there? 20 billion. Uh, and uh, the power bill is 110 megawatt. And the question that I would ask, you know, at what point are we willing to think of supercomputing as requires similar power envelope, similar cost bill. If you give me 110 megawatt and 2 billion, I can probably quite easily uh, get, uh, uh, you know, to exascale, 10 of exascale, hundreds of exascale in the future. Uh, so are we willing to spend that much on a supercomputer? Or the other question, do we need to spend that much or can we have fusion without building such a supercomputer? So thank you. And uh, thanks for your passions. <laughs> <laughs>